Hi guys, good morning. Welcome to another uh, Google Hangout with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Sam, I'll be your host today. We have um, Mrs. Gladys's class from Calgary, um, Mrs. Plant's class from Brampton, Ontario, Mrs. Lumley's class from Sarnia, oh, Sarnia. Sarnia. from Hinesville, uh, McNeil's uh, from Andrew, from Andrew. Andrew. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Pink, Mrs. Pink, uh, Guelph, Ontario, joining us as well as, as, well as Leanne, Allison, Leanne who Allison, a uh, documentary filmmaker from Canmore, Alberta. She's been uh, doing this for over 10 years. Um, and today she's going to be talking to us about storytelling in nature um, and as it relates to the digital age that we're in right now. So take it away, Leanne. Okay, well, it's great to be here, everyone. Um, yeah, so I... I'm going to tell you about two different major projects that I worked on. One where we used hardly any technology at all, and then one where we used tons of technology. So as you're hearing about these stories, I want you guys to think about how that would have affected how we experienced a certain place and how we told a story. So that's what I want you guys to think about. So I'm going to share my screen here now. Um, and get going. So we're going to do a, a mix of, um, I'm going to show you some clips from the films. And then I'm going to show you some, um, some pictures as well. Oh, it doesn't seem to be working. You are sharing a screen. Okay, I'm just going to try that one more time. Entire screen, share. Hmm. Well, that didn't work that time. Let me just try one more time, and then if not, I might just have to reload. Hmm. I'm just okay. So, um, it seems like Leanne has uh, is having some technical difficulties. She'll be back in hopefully very shortly. Oh, perfect. Okay, trying again here. Sharing my screen. Okay, let's see if I... Is that, is that working? Perfect. Yeah, that looks awesome. Okay, great. So, relating to nature and storytelling in the digital age. Um, so the first story I'm going to tell you about um, is about a long trip my husband and I did where we followed 120,000 caribou across the Yukon into Alaska. So this story couldn't have taken place anywhere else. It was completely tied to this place. And it felt like with a lot of these, this, this particular story, it didn't feel so much like we were actually creating this story. It was almost like this, the land just told us to tell this story because it was such an incredible place. Imagine following 120,000 caribou. And what they're doing right now is migrating. This is actually all the pregnant female caribou that are leading the migration that's like almost a thousand kilometers across the Yukon into Alaska. 
And what they do is they, they come to this one particular place to have their calves every year. And they've been coming to this place for over 20,000 years. And the reason we did the trip was because these calving grounds that they go to are, are um, threatened by oil and gas. So we wanted to share this story to show how important these calving grounds were to the caribou. And this trip was, was pretty life-changing. It totally changed the way my husband and I see the world. And it's sort of, it's shaped us. And so sometimes in life you have those experiences that kind of just change everything. And the other story I'm going to tell you is about Bear 71. And Bear 71 is the story of a, a bear in Banff National Park. And um, she basically in this story tells you about her life. And, um, but she knows everything about even the human world and, and the animal world. So she kind of becomes a bridge between the wild world and the wired world. And so um, she's, she's kind of living out the ultimate compromise between the two worlds. And like the rest of us, she's not perfect. Um, everyone makes mistakes. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, show you a little clip from the film. And this is on day four of the trip. I'm just going to make sure you guys are still there. Yeah, we're all good. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, I'm just going to hide that and bring this back. Okay, so this is during our trip with the caribou. And this is on day four, and it, we weren't even sure if this whole thing would work, but this was a pretty incredible thing that happened early on that made us think, okay, this is really going to work. Those are all caribou coming down the slope. What do you guys think that is? incredible. I mean, here we are in the middle of one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world, and then all quiet, not a sound, no jets, no planes, nothing. And then just this huge wave of life coming over, and you're seeing an age-old relationship play out right before your eyes. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. And it's, I don't know, at times like this, you just feel part of something a lot larger. Okay, so Karsten was talking about feeling that he was part of something a lot larger. And that, that um, was a good example where we were just seeing these old, like those, basically those wolves were, were uh, hunting, saw this opportunity to hunt those caribou. And it was pretty incredible to witness this. And this was only on day four of the trip. And the way this whole thing came about was that uh, my husband, Karsten, was a park warden in a national park in the northwest corner of the Yukon called Ivavik National Park. And the, the, that word means the place where life begins. And that was, park was established especially to protect the, these caribou's calving grounds so that they would always be safe to go there and have their calves. But the problem was these caribou would cross the border into Alaska, into a place called the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. But unfortunately, the little strip of land that protects their calving grounds was threatened by oil and gas. 
So my husband, Karsten, had, was really kind of haunted by the fact that these caribou were fine in Canada, but as soon as they went into Alaska, they were threatened. So we came up with this idea of, of following the caribou in order to um, try and protect them. Or, you know, to basically tell the story of, of um, these, this herd. When he first saw the caribou when he was patrolling in the park, they, they, it was a year where it was deep snow and the caribou had actually not made it to the calving grounds before they had their calves. And so unfortunately they had their calves and there's such a, a hugely instinctual drive for them to get to the calving grounds that these poor little calves had to keep walking to the calving grounds right when they were new, newborns. And if you can imagine 120,000 caribou walking across the Arctic, it's kind of like a moving buffet for grizzly bears, wolves, uh, eagles, all kinds of animals. And the bears, um, everything, it's, it was kind of a boon that year that they got to feed on lots of, lots of the calves. So it was bad for the caribou, but that year it was good for all the carnivores. So what made this trip so unique was that we literally didn't plan it out. Like most expeditions, you'd plan it, you'd have your food caches, you'd know exactly where you were going. But we actually had no set plan, and we allowed the caribou to guide us across the landscape. And in order to, to feed ourselves, we actually made our food caches like these balls that you see Karsten carrying, and then... When we started to run out of food, we would just call up the airplane and the airplane would just drop our food like anywhere we were. So that allowed us to have ultimate freedom to follow the caribou. And the caribou sometimes crossed giant rivers and we had to do the same. And, but what was amazing is they were, they were almost always with us. Even in storms, the caribou seemed to come by and sort of calm us down and help us feel okay about the trip. And then the other really great thing that happened on this trip, we were so lucky to meet this man in this photograph. His name is Randall Tetlichi, and he is from the Gwich'in First Nation of Old Crow. And he was a really wise man who seemed to kind of, almost it was like he knew we were going to show up. And he took us out on the land before we started, and he went hunting caribou, and he told us stories before we left about all the things that had happened to him in his lifetime and how the thing he'd learned is that you always have to stay calm no matter what happens. And then the other very important thing he told us was to pay attention to our dreams. And I'm just going to show you another clip from the film that um, is a little further along. We've survived through some storms. And this is just after we've had our first, one of our first um, food drops. Had a little bit of time. And then it's time to leave the comfort of this one shelter we had the whole time. And we've just... I'm really complaining about the big pack because it's so heavy with all the new food. So like I mentioned, it's like the bears are following the caribou too. No sooner did we come towards this campsite, we saw one over here digging. And that's probably this one here coming over the hill. This guy's new. He was coming right down the stream. But we've given him a bit of a bird. seem to be doing exactly what we're doing. So hanging around where caribou are headed or they've been. 
Yeah, we're just passing through here. So you can imagine that was a little bit intimidating, having those bears around. But we found that um, that we uh, it was actually we did have a bit of a scary encounter with the bear just then. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I, I slowed that I cut what that one off a little bit. But what happened there was there was an old sick bear that came right into our camp and was really curious and circling our tent and it was quite scary. But we were able to get it to go away by just holding up the tent and, and making kind of shouting at it. And if we were able to quit the trip at that point, we probably would have, but we were in such a remote area that we had to keep going. You know, those amazing caribou were our guides in this situation. And they, um, we realized that they weren't scared all the time and they were just continuing on with their lives and they just calmed us down and thinking about what Randall said. So it was like that encounter with the bears really kind of made us commit to this idea of being caribou because we were as vulnerable as they were to all the things out there in the Arctic. And I'm just going to show you one more clip, and then we're, um, we're going to move on to Bear 71. But let me just hide this. Okay, so the whole point of this trip was to go visit the calving grounds and see how these caribou, um, this was the place that was threatened, right? So let's look at this section, because this is really the crux of it all, and this is where it all really came together. It's about five in the morning. It's cleared off. See this little calf? Still shiny wet. I'm trying to take its first steps. You can see the umbilical cord hanging out the back of the cow there. Since we arrived five days ago, we've basically been hostages in the tent. So when there have been caribou around, we've literally been peeing in cups inside the tent, you know, going without water for long periods of time just for fear of disturbing them. And but the, if we do go outside, if they do see any movement, they will spook and the whole group will leave. And, you know, the people have talked about caribou and development coexisting. I just can't imagine they're as fragile as class right now. You know, they're they're constantly on the lookout. So, you know, we've we've been walking on eggshells the whole time, just to try not to disturb them. And as far as we know, we haven't yet. Okay, so that was a pretty amazing to see how fragile the caribou were on the cabin grounds and keep in mind that's the exact place where they wanted to drill for oil. So that was really the, the crux of the trip. But then after that, what happens is the caribou start rushing off into the mountains. And although they were really sensitive to us in the, in the time when they were having their calves, at this time you could see we could be right in amongst them and they didn't care at all. And the reason they're kind of panicked and they're all moving together into the mountains is that there's about to be this major onslaught of bugs. And they, what they do is they gather in these big groups in order to share the pain of the bugs. But they were going so fast and we wanted to keep up to them that we actually had to take advantage of the 24 hours of light in the Arctic and travel all the time. In fact, what we did is we, we wouldn't sleep like you normally sleep, eight hours a day. What we would do is we would take two or three hour naps and then we'd walk for six 
take two or three hours nap and then walk for eight. And we just tried to push ourselves to keep up to these amazing animals that were traveling so fast across the landscape. And then what started to happen was the craziest thing because we were, we were sort of working so hard and hardly getting any sleep is that we, we, I started, well, both Carson and I started to have these dreams. And then the next, day or the next few hours we we'd say to ourselves oh my gosh i just dreamt this this is what i just saw in my dreams and it was as if the world the the line between the waking world and the dream world was starting to blur and the other thing that randall had told us before we left is that the gwich'in people had always been able to talk to the caribou and the caribou could talk to people and it felt like we got this little glimpse into how that was possible. It was like we'd kind of woken up to this old way of being human that actually allows you to use your dreams to help navigate the world. And when we got back to the community of Old Crow, it was pretty amazing. We were still a, a day or so out of Old Crow, and the very first person we met was Randall. And he was so happy to see us, and we were so excited to, to see him. But it was interesting because he just wanted, he didn't want to talk, he just wanted to be around us. And it seemed like that's what happened with a lot of the people who we spoke to and encountered after the trip, is that they could just feel on us that we'd had this incredible experience out on their land. And we told stories that reminded them of how their grandparents and their great-grandparents used to speak about the land. So it was kind of amazing because Carson and I grew up both grew up in the city of Calgary which some of you guys are from too but just by having this really deep immersion in nature with no technology it seemed like we were able to experience the world in a totally unique way that like I said earlier has kind of shaped the way we see the world and what's really neat is that this film went on to be used in this campaign to protect this area. And it was probably seen by, gosh, almost a million people and it had a really big impact on this issue. And so it felt like our story um, of the caribou really resonated with a lot of people in a way that maybe other things didn't. And so we felt it was a big success. <clears throat> and we just recently signed on a letter to President Obama to, re to ask, along with about 200 other people, and art artists and, and movie stars and so on, to encourage him to finally protect this area for the caribou. And he may do it before he's done his presidency. So the next project I want to talk about is um, Bear 71. And um, I'm, I'm just conscious of the time. We don't have a lot of time, but what I'll tell you about this project is that it's uh, unique from a film. It's an interactive documentary that you can see on the National Film Board website, and it takes 20 minutes to go through it. And it was all inspired by these kinds of photos that are taken by motion-triggered camera images. If you can't quite tell, this is two grizzly bears fighting at night on a wildlife overpass in Banff National Park. This is this shot's also bears on an overpass in Banff Park. And the elk in a snowstorm. This bear really enjoying a rub tree. <coughs> There's a, a mountain sheep. Anyways, these what these pictures I found always had found them really really inspiring but I I was really trying to figure out what would be the best way to try and tell a story using these images and I went to the people at the National Film Board and I showed them some of these incredible pictures and they agreed that there was something to these images that was what that really was incredible and I spent a few months just pouring through thousands and thousands of these pictures because there are literally thousands of them around trying to figure out what the story was and finally realized we could tell the true story of Bear 71. 
And so we worked on how to do that. And I had partners in this trying to figure out how to design it. And there was like an army of people who, who created it. But let's just take a quick look at a little video that kind of gives you a sense of what this project is like. And then afterwards, I'd encourage you to, to check it out online. So I'm going to just hide this, go to another video, make it big. And so here's a little, little uh, teaser about what Bear 71 is about. That snare had a breaking strength of two tons. You know, I'm wearing a, a VHF collar and I have my own radio frequency. They also gave me a number. Bear 71. Banff National Park in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. Bears and humans here live closer together than any other place on Earth. That explains the radio caller constantly beeping my location to some ranger playing God. There are 15 remote sensing cameras in my home range, plus infrared counters and barbed wire snags to collect my hair. I call it the grid. Okay. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what it was about. I'm just going to show you a few more of these camera images because what, what they do for me lives, because these are all taken around the town of Canmore. And for those of you who are in Airdrie or Calgary, this is, this is your backyard. And it just reminds me that there's the lives of these animals are going on all the time. And it really takes me out of my own, own little world and makes me think of what their lives are like and I this is I'm just gonna end with this one because it's my favorite of all and it's a picture of a new this this grizzly cub was born this year and it was the first time that it was not this year because you can see it's 2011 but it's a young of year cub and it's the first time it's ever seen snow come out of the air and it's looking up going what the heck is this white stuff I just, I love how it captured that, that moment. So I'm just gonna unshare my screen. And am I back? You are, you back. are back. That was incredible. That was incredible. Let's, Let's uh, do we have some time for some questions? Uh, I, yeah, I think we have 10 minutes. Brilliant. Um, then I, I will pass it off to Mrs. Lumley's class first. Don't mute it, Ronan. No, it's not. No, it's not. I see you're talking. They can hear us. Awesome. Do you have can questions? Can you hear us? Does anybody have questions? <laughs> can you hear us? Yes. Uh, I can hear Mrs. Us. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I guess we started with you guys. So who wants to ask a question? Hey, Luke. Lucas. Go, oh, Luke. Oh, um, oh. I don't what was the stuff on your husband's face, like the white stuff that he put on his nose? Sunscreen. Oh, it was just uh, zinc. It's like a really strong sunscreen because you're up in the Arctic and it's really sunny. Okay. Now Luke just took mine. Do you have another class or another question, Mrs. Kames class? Uh, yeah, I think we do. Yeah, let's see. If you could have any other job, what would it be? If you could have any other job, what would it be? Oh, uh, well, I actually really like my job. I think it's uh, it's pretty great to be able to uh, tell stories for a living. So I don't think I'd pick another job. I'm actually pretty lucky. I like my job. I feel you. 
how did you how did you start like when did you start to have a passion for nature and when did you start doing films uh well it was just before the uh when before the caribou trip when my husband suggested we should go do this crazy adventure um, at the time I was working for a conservation group and I saw how powerful visual media was in order to, to get stories on the news. <laughs> so, um, I just decided to go off and do a one week training school out on Galliano Island and I got the skills to do um, documentary filmmaking and then I um, decided it was just really important to capture the trip so that we could at least share it with news so that we could fulfill our mission to try and um, help protect these caribou calving grounds. So it was kind of like just seeing the need for, for a job that, that needed to be done and just doing it. And then I've just continued with it ever since. Excellent. Okay. Let's move on to um, some Hi. questions from Mrs. Lumley's class. Wait, we have, wait, wait, we have audio. No. How this long? Okay. Well, then let's move on to questions from Mrs. McNeil's class. I I actually did hear one question there. It was how long was your longest trip? Oh, did you hear that? I couldn't hear it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the longest wilderness trip I've done. Well, there have been two that have been five months long, but that caribou trip was definitely the longest time in the wild where we saw very few people never cross a road basically um, we were just out there and that's that was what really made a huge impact on us and i, I think, um you know back to this technology and relating to nature i think um what i was trying to get across was i think we we had this really deep experience because we had no technology with us but then with with Bear 71, we actually use technology to kind of do a critique of technology. And there's this, I've been thinking a lot about, um, there's a, a metaphor I want you guys to think about, and you may not, it's like technology is all around us and we use it all the time, but we've got to remember it's a tool. And so tech, think of technology like a hammer and you pull it out and you use it for what you need. But rather than using it like a pair of glasses where it changes the way you see the world, but then you forget you have them on. So it's a good idea to just be aware. Of course you want to use technology because it's fun and it helps with lots of things in life, but just be aware that it is a tool and you want to know when you're using it and, and uh, realize that sometimes when you remove technology, you can actually have a really deep experience in uh in nature for sure next question excellent yeah okay go ahead addison what's the closest um how close have you been to, uh, just how close have you been to bear yeah. well that uh, that story that you saw the beginning of um that bear came right in right probably within about 10 or 12 feet of us oh. um but I think, you know, with that bear, it was, it was old, it was thin, you know, it was a little bit of a desperado. So all, every other bear we saw, and we saw dozens on that trip, well, as soon as they would see us, they would just run away. They, they were quite afraid of us. So we weren't, we, we really got used to being, um, just being out there and, and obviously being aware and being prepared, but we weren't scared all the time, which was a pretty neat felt like we were very mentally strong on that trip because of facing all those fears and, and those kind of realizing our true place in the ecosystem. But good question. Um, when you were doing Bear 71, um, how long did it take to film? Uh, well, with Bear 71, it actually took a couple of years for it to all come together. And it um, required some filming, but it also required a lot of 
um, programming from people in order to create the the website that's the interactive documentary. So um, it's a it was a two year process in order to um, kind of from the idea to when it was finished and was it, we were able to show it at a Sundance Film Festival. Excellent. Um, let's get some questions now from Mrs. McNeil's class. Michael, go ahead. Stand up. Um, <clears throat> what's your favorite animal? Hi, Michael. Well, geez. I think my favorite animal might be a wolverine because they're so elusive and they're so wild and they need a lot of wilderness to survive. And I've only seen a few in my life and lots of people have never seen them. So I think that's my favorite animal. And it's so strong, it can travel so far so fast. What's your favorite animal, Michael? Um, a snake. <laughs> a snake. Cool. Thanks for, for listening so well, you guys. Okay. That's really great. Another question. Um, any other crazy things you've seen or done? Um, well, we did another trip after the caribou trip, and that was um, once our son was born. He was only two and a half, and we did this crazy trip with him and our dog, and we traveled all the way across the country to meet the author, Farley Mowat, and we spent five months doing that. And you can, we actually made a film about that, too. It's called Finding Farley. And that's on the National Film Board website. And uh, there's a teacher's guide to that, so you could do it as a lesson. It's, it's a great, uh, great film. And Farley Mowat is a great, great author. If you haven't read any of his books, Owls in the Family, People of the Deer, Never Cry Wolf. So that, that was a pretty crazy trip with a two and a half year old. We basically canoed to Hudson Bay. How many of you know where Hudson Bay is? We only canoed from Canmore, Alberta, all the way to Hudson Bay. So that was a pretty long trip. Thank you so Good. much. Okay, last question from our class. How many places have you been to? Um, well, I've been to lots of places in Canada. Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, well, just about every province and territory. And I've been to Antarctica and Alaska, and South America. But there's lots of places I haven't been. I've never been to Europe, I've never been to Asia. But lots, of, I've, I've traveled a lot, a lot in Canada. I really like it here. Excellent. Um, let's get some questions from uh, Mrs. McLarnon's class now. Um. Sorry, Mrs. McLarnon, we just had you muted. Um, uh, <laughs> How's that? There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for doing this today, Leanne. It's really interesting. Um, we have two questions. The first one is, um, I personally couldn't help but think you must have been MacGyvering that whole trip. Were there tools or what, what was something really interesting that you had to rig up to solve any type of problem that you had? And then we've got a question from Jordan. Um, geez. <clears throat> I guess what our biggest problem on that trip was, um, was that we were always hungry. Like we just never had enough food to sustain us for the number of calories we were putting out. And so um, I was really impressed one day when Karsten came up with a little hand line. He brought this little bit of fishing line and a fishing lure. And when we were right out of food, he was able to catch like four or five of these little um, grayling, graylings in one of the creeks. And so that was probably the best MacGyvering. Oh, and then at the end, geez, I almost forgot this. We got really hungry and we had no food for four days. And he actually used a little bit of snare wire to um, hunt for ground squirrels. And so we actually ate like what people would know of as gophers, but we ate like four or five ground squirrels 
And it was funny because when we got back to Old Crow, we showed them the footage of how we skin them. And they're like, ah, you don't skin them, you singe them. Because that way you get all the fat on the, and you get all that good fat. So it turned out we didn't actually process them right. But, and they're like, if you ever get any more of those, you bring us some because they're a real delicacy. So yeah, he was, a, he was my, my husband was a good survivalist on that trip. He was pretty awesome. Oh, thank you. Okay, Jordan has a question now. <laughs> um, we're going to be making a four-minute documentary about water in our community, and do you have any advice on how to film it? Okay, wow. Um, well, I guess, you know what I think with all the projects that I've done, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is you want people to think that this thing matters and you want them to care. And so you want to try and touch people emotionally about this. So a lot of the time, the way to do that is to make it a personal story. So maybe you can find someone in your community that has a real personal connection to water. Um, I mean, that that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of technical things around filming. Um, you know, what you want to, have a have a plan before you go like try and map out your story on paper make your shot list of what you want um you know try and keep your camera as steady as you can get good sound um I mean, those are just some things off the top of my head but but i would say make it personal and 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 try and touch people's hearts with your stories Awesome. And we've just got one more classroom. Uh, Mrs. Gladys, do we have some questions from you guys? Um, that's good. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. <laughs> she forgets. <laughs> what well, was your favorite part of your trip? Um, hmm, probably the favorite part the most memorable part is being actually in those calving grounds like you saw where we had to be so quiet in order to not disturb the caribou and we just saw them giving birth all around us. It felt like this really, really sacred, special time and special place. So I think my favorite part. Um, why were the bears brown in the video? Brown? Yes. Those ones were brown bears. Those were grizzly bears. Oh. Oh yeah, they're brown. They were polar bears. They were grizzly bears. There's there's grizzly bears and polar bears in the Arctic. And we we didn't see any polar bears on this trip. We just saw grizzly bears. But the polar bears were a little not that far away. They were out on the on the sea ice. We just didn't see them. But that's a good question. As you'd think, Arctic polar bears, but there's actually grizzly bears in, in the Arctic. We have one more. What was your most, what was the grossest part of the trip? The grossest part of the trip, hmm. Um, well, as you can imagine, on a trip like that, you couldn't have too many showers. Um, so I think it was a little bit uh, hard to stay clean until we got to this, like through the winter part where it was still snowy and too cold to have baths and streams and stuff. That was a little gross. I didn't wash my hair for 42 days at one stretch before we had water. All right. Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, I'm going to turn everybody's microphones back on so you guys can all give her a nice thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.